As someone who lives under the dual specters of ADHD and autism, my gaming habits are what I would describe as a little bit weird. I find myself getting hyper fixated on either a specific game or a specific series of games for large chunks of time. I would say usually stretching a couple of months, sometimes even up to a year, before suddenly out of nowhere feeling completely worn out and sick of that game or series and moving on to a new one. This does come in rotations sometimes. For example, I find myself hyper fixated on Fire Emblem for long stretches, and then I take a couple of months off, only to become hyper fixated again. Although sometimes it's sort of a flash in the pan type situation. I got really, really fixated on Assassin's Creed for a few months, and then haven't gone back to it since then. My most recent hyper fixation has been the Pokemon series which is actually pretty convenient timing because I got back into it a few months before the new Generation 9 games came out, Scarlet and Violet. These are, I think it's safe to say, some of the most anticipated games of 2022, although also quite possibly some of the most controversial games of 2022. And I'm not saying controversial as in they include a gay character, therefore people on the internet get super mad, but as in there is a large group of people who are super excited for a new Pokemon generation, and an equally large group of people who think that the games by default are going to be shit. While it may be tempting to dismiss that second group as simply being blinded by nostalgia or upset that modern Pokemon isn't faithfully recreating the generation that they grew up with, I don't necessarily think that that is the case. There are quite a few reasons to be distrustful of Game Freak and the Pokemon Company, given the most recent entries in the game being kind of subpar. Sword and Shield is my least favorite mainline game in the series. BDSP is a horribly handled remake that while not directly made by Game Freak, is still bearing the official Pokemon seal, so I do think it's fair to hold them responsible for the mess that is that game. And while Legends Arceus is something that I personally enjoyed, and I think a great many other people really enjoyed, there are some pretty big problems with the game and its open world design in particular that it is valid to assume will be carried over to Scarlet and Violet even prior to playing the games. That said, I personally am not on the all modern Pokemon sucks bandwagon because I've sort of noticed a pattern in Pokemon games in terms of their quality and the fluctuation thereof. I tend to think that Pokemon comes in highs and lows, and it tends to really strongly alternate between these. For example, X and Y are games that, while I personally like, I can recognize the inherent flaws and incompleteness in them, and understand why they are some of the most hated games in the franchise. However, Sun and Moon are, in my opinion, absolute masterpieces, and probably Gen 7 is my favorite generation, although I'm not fully decided at this point. Generation 8 was fairly disappointing, but that doesn't necessarily mean that Generation 9 is going to follow in its footsteps. While I'm not a fan of open world games, and a lot of the lead up to Scarlet and Violet has been... Uh, shall we say, not the greatest? I also don't want to necessarily dismiss it out of hand, and so I entered into the ninth generation of Pokemon with cautious optimism, especially considering a lot of the Pokemon revealed prior to the game's release were low-key adorable, which is to be expected, they're going to show off their winners, not their losers, but again, I don't want to naturally assume that these games are trash. However, I regret to tell you that these games are absolute trash and allow me to break down why. Pitchforks down, hands off the dislike button, stop typing out death threats in the comments section. It's more complicated than that. 
As much as I would love to say, Pokemon Scarlet and Violet are weeb trash, just put your cartridge in the garbage disposal and turn it on, <sighs> that would be dishonest and inflammatory, and that sort of sentiment is reserved for video thumbnails and titles. In the actual body of my work, I try not to be inflammatory and hyperbolic. I've actually been having a lot of fun with Pokemon Scarlet, and there are several features that made me very excited. Unfortunately, the way that the game is held together, and some mind-bogglingly stupid decisions, lead me to dislike it more than like it. I think that this might actually take the crown from Sword and Shield for my least favorite Pokemon generation. I'm going to break down why and try to avoid late game spoilers, however, given the open world nature of Pokemon Scarlet and Violet, if you are trying to avoid spoilers completely, I would recommend clicking off. It's impossible for me to say what gym would be your first gym and which direction you would head out, and while there are definitely some areas that are more late game and some that are more early game, it's kind of hard for me to know what direction your specific playthrough made, and I think impossible, therefore, to say exactly how far in the spoilers go. I'm not going to talk about anything beyond my first two gyms, my first two titans, and my first one team star base, but that doesn't mean that I didn't tackle them in a different order than you. So, yeah, consider this a spoiler warning. Part 1. The Good. As this video is probably going to be mostly negatives, I figured it would be appropriate to start with the positives in order to show that I'm not just an old lady hating on modern games. For the first time in the entire Pokemon franchise, there is in-depth character customization. This goes beyond simply selecting a portrait between the different skin and hair colors, but down to picking your style, giving yourself freckles and beauty marks. It's not the most in-depth thing in the world, but there's 12 different types of eyebrows, for example. Your taste in Pokemon design is obviously subjective, but I like most of the new Pokemon, and even the ones that I'm not a huge fan of, I don't hate, both from a aesthetics perspective and a gameplay perspective. In fact, my team has been a rotating roster of new Pokemon, because I can't decide on just six who I want in my party. While some of them are regional variants of old classics, such as the Fighting-type Tauros or the new Ground and Poison-type Wooper, others are brand new, like Fido, the pure fairy dog made out of bread. In addition to being a fan of the Pokemon designs, I also really like a lot of the character designs. It is a Pokemon game, so their characterization is somewhat limited, but it's better, in my subjective opinion, than the characters in Sword and Shield. As an early example, Hop is one of the most notoriously stupid rivals in the series, whereas your rival in Scarlet and Violet is already a champion and uses lower rank Pokemon in the earlier fights with you because she wants to be on the same level as you. She has a thing about being obsessed with battling, it's kid stuff because it's a kid's game, but it's more interesting than just Hop running around and challenging you for seemingly no reason. Plus, her design is great. They didn't just reuse How from Sun and Moon. As for the school aspect, that serves mostly as a series of really in-depth tutorials, which are all thankfully optional, about both past mechanics, such as the physical special split, and new mechanics, like how picnics work which is surprisingly complicated, and I'm not fully sure I have a grasp. I know that you can use it to get stronger powers, like extra experience, or I think also eggs? I don't know. The classes are fun, though, and the teachers are, as with all of the other characters, kind of eccentric, but pretty fun. While I'm not the biggest fan of open world games in general, Scarlet and Violet does a decent job of justifying its open world nature. One of the bigger changes is that instead of random trainers catching your eyesight and challenging you, now you have to go and challenge them. 
Even if they're just standing around on a route and you run directly into their face, they will never initiate a battle. This is kind of an inevitability of going open world, as it would be very easy to just sneak around any trainers with as wide and empty of a world as they have. However, I don't hate it. Non-boss trainers are never much of a challenge in non-hacked games anyway, so making them purely a resource for grinding money and experience is pretty good. Plus, you're encouraged to fight them even if you're trying not to grind for experience, because certain items are locked behind representatives standing at the Pokemon Center who will be like, If you fight five trainers in this area, I'll give you a cool item. Additionally, there are fights that are mandatory, for example, sometimes you will have to fight gym trainers before fighting the gym leader, and at certain points in the story, your rival will show up and challenge you to a battle before you can progress. Speaking of the story, there's three of them now, a fact that the trailer emphasized over and over in order to get us excited for all the new possibilities that come along with being in an open world. The three stories are, as I cynically predicted, Get eight gym badges, defeat the evil team, and find out about the box legend. All things that generally feature in the singular story of past generations. So three stories isn't additional content. However, they do do a decent job of justifying the branching nature of the stories. Each of them has you do a different series of tasks. Collect eight gym badges has you go to eight different towns, go to the gyms, complete a gym puzzle, sometimes battle gym trainers, and then fight the gym leader who, once you defeat them, gives you a badge. Your reward in addition to the gym badge is a unique TM and the ability to catch higher level Pokemon, something that is lifted straight out of Sword and Shield. More interesting to me are the other two quest lines. The one revolving around the legendary Pokemon in my case, Coridon, because Scarlet version, best version, has you going and fighting five different Titan Pokemon, which are basically totems. And I'm a huge fan of this, actually. I like boss fight wild Pokemon as an idea, and it's not a full copy-paste of totem Pokemon. There's no SOS mechanic in Gen 9, so rather than getting backup, you just fight them in two stages with boosted stats. In the first stage, you are fighting against them on your own, and in the second stage, you fight them in a 2v1 double battle where you get help from an NPC. However, they are buffed and tend to be stronger than a Pokemon in your party if you are keeping on level. Your reward for this is new movement options for Coridon, or if you're playing the bad version of the game, Muridon. For example, when I defeated my first Titan, I got the ability to swim on the back of Coridon. The third and most interesting is the Team Star storyline. When I say most interesting, I don't mean plot-wise, it is still just a generic evil team story, nothing we haven't seen a million times, and is definitely always the worst part of any Pokemon game. But mechanically, they kind of beefed it up. It combines the Titans with the gym battles and is pretty interesting. You start by invading an elemental-themed base and bring in a couple of Pokémon to auto-battle with other Pokémon. Once you've defeated all of the Grunts through auto-battles, you then get the chance to fight the Team Star boss or equivalent to admins in previous games. They are elemental-themed, so kind of reflects the gym leaders in that way, and have multiple Pokémon. However, their ace is a Titan-equivalent type thing? It doesn't have two stages, but it does have a giant health bar at the top of the screen and is unique and I'm assuming has stat boosts. So it kind of feels like they are a gym leader that owns a totem Pokemon, if that makes any sense. The reward you get for these is an expansion of the crafting system, which don't worry, I will touch upon in the negatives because the crafting system sucks ass. But I want to stay positive. Let's stay positive. Let's talk about the big showcase gimmick, terrestrialization. Because I actually really like terrestrialization. I think it's my favorite of the generational gimmicks. Mega Evolution was too sparsely distributed, Z moves just felt really overpowered, and Dynamax was kind of boring. 
but terrestrialization gives you quite a few options and NPC trainers make use of terrestrialization in pretty interesting ways. For example, gym leaders' aces tend not to be of the type of the gym, but rather they terrestrialize into that type. The bug gym leader has an ace that is a Teddy Ursa that terrestrializes into a bug type Teddy Ursa. On the other hand, your rival will terrestrialize her ace, which is whatever starter you didn't pick, into a type it already has, thus powering up its stab moves. Terrestrialization is also just really interesting to make use of yourself, both in single player and multiplayer. Speaking of competitive, I really like that Game Freak seems to be focusing on rebalancing competitive with this generation. For example, the hail buff or the nerf to recovery moves. Not all of these are things that I personally want out of competitive, but I'm glad that they're at the very least trying. For example, the nature changing herbs that were introduced in Generation 8 are now available before the post game, making it easier to set up your competitive team earlier. There's some other cool quality of life stuff such as Move Reminder being free and doable from the menu, which is both impactful for multiplayer and for single player. Maybe you accidentally forgot Toxic Spikes but want it back. Last but not least, I want to touch upon the difficulty because in some ways they did improve it. While it's still a children's game, and so as an adult who knows elemental type advantages, it's never going to be that hard to beat the computer. They did make some major strides in making the computer less completely brain dead. The AI is still kind of broken, but gym leaders no longer have only two or three Pokemon. I fought one with four Pokemon fairly early in the story, and I wouldn't be surprised if we went back to having five or even six Pokemon in late game gym leader parties. However, there are other aspects where the difficulty has definitely gotten significantly worse. And that's going to serve as a nice transition into part two. Part two. The stinky, stinky, stinky bad, stinky bad. Okay, so despite the fact that we clear the very low bar of having more than three Pokemon on our gym leaders teams and having fully evolved Pokemon on the gym leaders teams, things that are surprisingly rare in modern Pokemon games... We do still have some problems of the, for lack of a better term, babification of the difficulty. They really took the fact that these are kids games and ran with it. And I will excuse some amount of lack of difficulty by the fact that these are kids games. They are intended for children, not for adult audiences. However, Game Freak really does seem committed to removing all possible forms of difficulty from the Pokemon franchise. For the third time in a row, your rival takes the Pokemon who you have a type advantage over, as opposed to the one who has a type advantage over you. Additionally, they've removed the option to play on set mode, which technically doesn't actually make the game any harder because you can just always choose not to switch out, but it does add the time tax of pressing B, and the removal of set mode feels completely pointless and arbitrary. Playing on switch mode is of course easier than playing on set mode, but there's no meaningful difference between playing on set mode and just hitting B at the end of every Pokemon fight. It is so mind-boggling to me that they took out the option to play on set mode, which has been in the game from generation one, seemingly for no reason. Not only is this a pointless decision, but it's something that almost certainly costs them labor hours. Because Scarlet and Violet is almost certainly operating using the Skeleton of Sword and Shield as its baseline, this means that they had to devote resources to removing set mode, as opposed to simply not devoting resources to adding it in. In addition to either making the single player mode easier or more tedious, Removing set mode also further separates multiplayer Pokemon from single player Pokemon, which is really bizarre considering that this generation continues the trend of Game Freak seemingly trying to balance out overpowered strategies in competitive to make competitive more fun. 
but you don't play on Switch mode in competitive. You play on set. If you played on Switch mode in competitive, matches would simply be decided by whoever gets the first knockout, because then the opposing player could always switch to their counter. God, I realize now as I'm saying this that I haven't checked to make sure that the multiplayer isn't also forced onto switch mode, and honestly, the fact that I feel I need to check if the multiplayer has been switched onto switch mode, yeah, that does not speak highly of my faith in Game Freak. Now, it may seem like I'm harping on this one tiny change for way too long, and I kind of am, I will fully admit that. We're three minutes into the negatives and all I've talked about is the removal of Switch Mode. However, I think it demonstrates an attitude that Game Freak and the Pokemon Company have of just sort of rejecting any semblance of difficulty from the Pokemon games. My only justification I can think of for the removal of the set mode is that they know hardcore Nuzlocks use the set mode, since it was recently revealed that Game Freak considers Nuzlocking to be basically hacking and cheating. When combined with the fact that they merge affection and friendship mechanics, it just feels like they have no interest in the single player mode being all that difficult, which then leaves you to wonder, what experience are you gaining from the single player mode? I am not of the opinion that every game needs to be difficult, and in fact, I enjoy non-difficult games. However, I want to feel like I am gaining something from the experience, and if I'm devoting a large chunk of time to a long Pokemon adventure, I'm clearly not getting difficulty, so what am I getting? If I look at another non-difficult game that I enjoy, Breath of the Wild is a fairly easy game, however, I enjoy exploring the world and it is a very well thought out and designed world. Pokemon's graphics leave a lot to be desired, so you don't get the beauty from Breath of the Wild, and a lot of the open world is just big empty fields full of Pokemon, so you don't really get the culture either. Paldea, much more than other regions, feels super empty, because you spend so much time running around open fields and empty mountains, you occasionally see a trainer that you can choose to challenge to a battle, but you have no way of knowing whether they are even going to be a challenge to you because a lot of the trainers end up having Pokemon that are 10 or more levels lower than you. The reason that you so often end up vastly overleveled compared to random trainers and even boss fights is that this game was not designed with an open world in mind. While the quest structure does support an open world, everything else about this game does not. Paldea is too big and too unpopulated to really allow for exploring the open world to feel like anything other than wasting your time running, and while you do get a series of objectives you are allowed to tackle in any order, you are clearly supposed to tackle them in a specific order. This is because opponents don't scale the levels of their Pokémon. And I'm not just talking random trainers. Bosses do not scale the levels of their Pokémon. This feels like a huge oversight, and not just from the perspective of someone who enjoys Nuzlocking, and therefore is going to have to tackle things in a specific order thanks to level caps, but even from a casual perspective. What's the point of battling things out of order? if you're going to end up with level 60 Pokemon fighting a team of level 15s. If anything, the fact that you are encouraged to tackle it in any order simply serves to hide what the intended order is. Now when you look at the map, there are two different gyms whose descriptions say that they are often the first gyms that people visit. However, they have different levels of Pokemon, and it doesn't change depending on what order you visit them. The Bug Gym will always have weaker Pokémon than the Grass Gym, but you can go to either of them first, I suppose. Now, I understand that it would be a bit much to ask for them to design eight different teams for each Gym Leader, depending on whether they were the first or eighth Gym Leader. However, you could at the very least scale up the levels of their Pokémon. 
And they're keeping track of what order you complete objectives in. As when you look on the map, it shows you 1, 2, 3, 4, etc. to indicate which objective you completed first, second, third, overall. Additionally, within each story, there are events that happen after a certain number of things. For example, you have to fight your rival before you can challenge the third gym. No matter which gym you choose to challenge third, she will always be waiting for you in the lobby of the building. Additionally, the actual story adjusts based on the order in which you do events. There is a cutscene that takes place after you defeat the first Titan, and that cutscene will take place no matter which Titan you defeat first. This actually led to a hilarious moment during my first playthrough. I accidentally fought a harder Team Star base before tackling an easier one because there is no indication of what level the various objectives should be tackled at. As such, when I approached my second Team Star base, I got a phone call where someone told me, Team Star is on the lookout for you, this is going to be harder than it was last time. And then I go in and the boss has Pokemon who are almost 10 levels lower than the previous Team Star base. So the game is clearly tracking how many badges, Team Star bases, and Titans you've defeated. And they've shown us in the past that they have the capability of adjusting the levels of your opponent's Pokemon based on certain factors, such as in the Armor of Isle, where you will face much higher level Pokemon if you were in the post-game compared to not in the post-game. Why is it then that in an open world game where you are encouraged to tackle things in any order, they don't implement any sort of rudimentary level scaling? Honestly, if the reason you were excited for Scarlet and Violet is you've been looking for an open world Pokemon game, you should look into Crystal Clear. It's a ROM hack of Generation 2 where you can fight any of the 16 gym leaders in whatever order you want, and their teams adjust based on how many gym badges you have. Once again, the ROM hacking community is doing significantly better job at creating Pokemon games than Nintendo Game Freak or the Pokemon Company. I suppose I can take that as cold comfort, as it means that the ROM hacking community will almost certainly immediately release a patch that includes set mode. Small victories, I suppose. So, there is one more new feature to Pokemon Scarlet and Violet that just absolutely infuriates me, and that is the crafting system. Why Pokemon decided they need a crafting system is beyond me. I do not understand why so many games have just decided that crafting is once again the most popular thing in the world. Between Elden Ring and Scarlet and Violet, it's just like, why? Why are you adding crafting systems to non-survival games? This crafting system is for TMs, which are no longer infinite use and now are single-use items. You gain crafting materials from either defeating or catching wild Pokemon, and need to use those crafting materials to make TMs. However, the crafting materials are specific to each species of Pokemon, and you usually need three or more items just to craft a TM one time. This means that if you are trying to build a competitive team where multiple Pokemon need the same move, or you just want to teach all of your Grass-type Pokemon Trailblaze, or all of your Water-type Pokemon Scald, or whatever it is you're trying to do, you're going to have to go out into the wild and kill 50 million Teddy Ursas for Teddy Ursa Claws just so you can craft all the TMs you need. It's absolutely infuriating, and it is just a waste of my time! I understand that different people come to Pokemon for different things, however, I don't think anyone finds grinding on wild Pokemon to be the most fun part of the experience. Okay, so last but not least is a couple of technical things. The graphics are pretty bad for a modern game. I'm willing to cut them some amount of slack because the Switch is a handheld console that is six years old at this point. However, there are games on the Switch that look significantly better than Pokemon Scarlet and Violet, such as Xenoblade Chronicles 3. I don't think graphics are the most important thing in the world, so it doesn't bother me that much, but it does feel a little bit odd that for a game that was so highly anticipated and they knew was going to be a 
big seller. They didn't put a little bit more time into making sure that it looks nice. What I am willing to harp on about, however, is that it is embarrassing that nine generations in, we do not have voice acting for Pokemon. Now, I don't expect every single trainer to voice act their lines, but something like Three Houses, where major cutscenes are fully voiced, feels like the bare minimum for the highest selling multimedia franchise in the world. This is especially apparent during some of the many cutscenes, where the text auto-scrolls, so <laughs> if you aren't able to read fast enough, I guess eat shit? They should have at least voiced those cutscenes. Like, that's inexcusable. But yeah, those are my thoughts on Pokemon Scarlet and Violet. It's ultimately really disappointing, and is probably the game that is making me lose faith in the Pokemon Company's ability to make good Pokemon games. <sighs> I would say just uh, play it if you want to, but don't expect the thrilling open world Pokemon experience that you were hoping for. I'm excited to see what ROM hackers do with this because it feels like it is only three or four changes away from being something really special. I'm sure there's some way to add scaling as far as the uh, boss encounters go, and that would go a long way towards making this a very, very fun experience. I do want to close by saying I am still playing and enjoying the game, despite its significant flaws. It's probably not one I will revisit, at least not until there are some significant mods in place, but uh, yeah, I'm liking it. Check it out for yourself if you want, but if you don't think it's worth $60, I honestly don't blame you. Part 3. The Shiny! Okay, as a quick treat for everyone who stuck around to the end, very funny story from when I was playing Pokemon Scarlet. So, in all of my years of playing Pokemon, I have never once got a shiny, if you don't count the red Gyarados in Heart Gold, Soul Silver, and Gold Silver Crystal. In Pokemon Scarlet, I got my first ever shiny, and I was very excited until I realized it was a male combi. Honestly, I'm not even mad. This is kind of just hilarious. Um, first shiny ever, despite playing Pokemon ever since Generation 1, and uh, it's a fucking male combi. Like... <laughs> oh. Good night, everyone.